Hello dear friends, this is your personal English coach Professor DC and in this video we will be understanding a speech given by Margaret Atwood at the University of Toronto, Canada on June 14, 1983. The title of her speech is Attitude. But before we actually understand the speech, let's get to know the author a little bit. Margaret Lena Atwood is a Canadian poet, novelist, literary critic, essayist, inventor, teacher and environmental activist. She has published 18 books of poetry, 18 novels, 11 books of non-fiction, 9 collections of short fiction, 8 children's books and 2 graphic novels as well as a number of small press editions of both poetry and fiction. Atwood has won numerous awards and honors of her writing, including the Booker Prize, that is twice, Arthur C. Clarke Award, Governor General's Award, Franz Kafka Prize, and the National Book Critics and Penn Center USA Lifetime Achievement Awards. Now you know that the chapter you have in your syllabus is written by a world famous author. So why don't we get started? You can imagine a gathering which consists of students, teachers and various respected people of the university gathered at a place, maybe a hall and then there's a stage right in front of the gathering and the most honored authors of fiction in the history, Margaret Atwood is called upon to deliver this speech and she starts off. Now her speech is obviously in first person, so to explain her speech, I will become Margaret Atwood and you can imagine that you are amongst the various people sitting in the audience and listening to me. Let's get started. I am of course overjoyed to be here today in the role of ceremonial object, meaning I am very happy to be the part of this ceremony. There is more than usual amount of satisfaction in receiving an honorary degree from the university that helped to form one's erstwhile callow, an ignorant mind into the thing of dubious splendor that it is today. Meaning, the satisfaction that you receive from getting your academic degree from this university is more than average, is more than usual because this university has helped one's immature mind and ignorant mind to be transformed into one that is magnificent. Whose professors put up with so many overdue term papers and struggle to read one's handwriting of which interesting is the best that has been said. Meaning a university wherein students did not complete their term papers, they do not complete the term papers on time and therefore the lecturers, teachers and professors have to tolerate them and the students do not have good handwriting, at least a few of them and the professors and teachers find it very hard to read their assessments and term papers and after reading the bad handwriting the lecturers and professors would say, hmm, interesting. Moving on, at which one failed to learn Anglo-Saxon and somehow missed bibliography entirely, meaning a university wherein a student always was unsuccessful in learning the traditional language, the old English language and a university wherein the students missed to go through some of the best reference books which would have been very helpful to them in their scholarly work. They completely missed these things. Moving on, a severe error which I trust no one present here today has committed. So missing these things out is according to me the worst thing that a student can do and I'm very sure all of you would not have committed the same mistake that those students did. 
and at which one underwent excruciating agonies not only of soul but of body. And because they missed these important things, they had to go through a lot of pain. They were tense during their exams. They had sleepless nights. So they underwent extreme physical and mental suffering. Later traced to having drunk too much coffee in the bowels of Wymilwood. And why did they undergo extreme physical and mental suffering? It's because while they were tensed about dealing with term papers and assignments, they were drinking too much coffee in the university building, which did not prove to be very good for the body. So they thought that the suffering is because of the things they missed, but in reality, it was because of the ill effects of the coffee. It is to Victoria College that I can attribute the fact that Bell Canada, Oxford University Press and McLeland and Stewart all failed to hire me in the summer of 63 on the grounds that I was A. Overqualified and B. Could not type, thus producing in me that state of joblessness angst and cosmic depression which everyone knows is indispensable for novelists and poets although nobody has ever claimed the same for geologists dentists and chartered accountants it is because of this college that i can say that i was not hired by great companies bell canada oxford university press and mcleland and stewart they did not hire me in the summer of 1963 why because they thought I was overqualified. I did have qualifications, but they exceeded the qualifications they wanted. And another reason is I never knew typing. And because of these two reasons, they never hired me. I was jobless. And because of this joblessness, I went into great depression, anxiety, and sadness. And all of you sitting here know that the novelists and poets they undergo great depression, great setbacks in the initial years of their career. Well, if a person wanted to become a geologist or dentist or chartered accountant, they didn't have to go through the phase that I had been. It is also due to Victoria College incarnated in the person of Northrop Five that I didn't run away to England to become a waitress, live in a garret, write masterpieces and get tuberculosis. Now, you all know that I became a student of Northrop Fry at Victorian College in the University of Toronto that is right here. And because of the education that this college has provided, I did not have to face hard times. Unlike most people who take up a part-time job in England and then follow their passion. I didn't have to run away to England and become a waitress and live in a very small room which had dirty conditions and staying there follow my passion and get a dangerous disease. No, this college helped me to follow my passion without any of the severe hardships. He thought I might have more spare time for creation if I ran away to Boston, lived in a stupor wrote footnotes and got anxiety attacks. That is, if I went to graduate school. And he was right. So Northrop Fry, of whose student I was, he was thinking that if I went to a department of university for advanced work by graduates, that is, if I went to graduate school, where students usually are anxious according to my observation, he thought I would have enough time for following my passion. And I guess he was right. So, for all the benefits conferred upon me by my alma mater, where they taught me that the truth would make me free, but failed to warn me of the kind of trouble I'd get into by trying to tell it, I remain duly grateful. So, I am very thankful for all the things that this university has provided I am very grateful to this university who taught me the truth of life. I am thankful to the university who explained to me that truth 
will make me free. Although this university never told me of all the troubles I would get into after completing my degree. This university gave me everything but never warned me of any troubles that I would face after getting a degree. But of all that the university has given, I am very very thankful. But everything has its price. Nothing comes easy. You have to work hard for it. You cannot get anything easily. No sooner had I tossed off a graceful reply to the letter inviting me to be present today than I began to realize the exorbitance of what was expected of me. So this university, they wrote me a letter and invited me to speak on this day right now. I read the letter, I read the invitation and immediately replied to the university, all right, I'll be there and I'll give a speech. But after I responded, I realized that what was expected by the university delegates was huge. It was not just a speech, but something very bigger than that. The university expected a lot of things from me in my speech. That I realized only when I had responded in haste. So, as you all must be aware, I have completed my PhD and that is the very reason I have been called upon to deliver a speech. I was excited to receive an invitation from your university. But then I thought, hmm, what am I supposed to do after PhD? I have no idea. I was going to have to come up with something to say to a graduating class in 1983 year of the PhD, taxi driver, when young people have unemployment the way they used to have ugly blackheads, something presumably useful, wise, filled with resonance and overview, helpful, encouraging and optimistic. So when I got the letter from the university, I responded and then I thought of the speech that I had to deliver. I was going to something that's positive. I was going to speak something that was optimistic, filled with a lot of encouragement, wise and useful. The university expected me to come up with something that was supposed to be very useful to you all. The university told me that you'll have a graduating class sitting in front of you. So you have to encourage them, speak positive things. Because young people these days are unemployed. That was what the university expected of me. After all, you are being launched. Though, ever since I experienced the process, I have wondered why convocation is the name for it. Convocation is gathering of people, calling people together. Well, that's not what is done on the last day of the college. The students have gathered because they completed their degrees and now they won't be attending the college anymore. Ejection would be better. According to me, this word called ejection, metaphorically speaking, is the right word because you as students are being thrown out of this college. You have completed your degree and you won't be attending the college anymore. Now you have to face the real world. Now you have to try and get a job, get a family, get your goals accomplished. After today onwards. Even in the best of times, it's more or less like being pushed over a cliff. And these are not the best of times. Imagine yourself on a trek. You have climbed a cliff which is nothing but a steep rock face especially at the edge of the sea. The moment you reach the edge is the moment you complete your college. And after the day of convocation, you are thrown in the sea of life. So I can tell you that completing the college getting a degree and then facing the real life is as good as 
pushing a student from over a cliff edge. And let me tell you that these are not the best of times. You will feel difficult when you get out of this college and deal with real life. In case you have not figured out already, I'm here to tell you that it's an armpit out there. I'm very sure that you must have understood from my sentences about what I'm trying to tell you. All I'm trying to tell you that it's not fancy anymore. You have to face the world and you need strength, you need mental and physical readiness to get a job, to get family and to resolve life's difficult problem so it's like an armpit which is metaphorically speaking a place regarded as extremely unpleasant as for your university degree there are definitely going to be days when you feel that you have been given a refrigerator and sent to the middle of a jungle where there are no three pronged grounded plug holes so this is the second example that i am giving you you would feel that all right, I've got this degree, I've completed the college and I have everything to deal with life henceforth. But if you ask me, I will tell you that there will be times when you have to look out for things rigorously to get what you want and it is as good as someone giving a refrigerator to you and putting you in the middle of a dense jungle where you have to find a plug into which you can turn on this refrigerator. There are definitely going to be days when things will be difficult. Not only that, the year will come when you will wake up in the middle of the night and realize that people you went to school with are in positions of power and may soon actually be running things. Maybe couple of days, couple of months after you have got a job, after you have chosen what to do, you will realize from the news and from other sources, maybe from your friends, that the person with whom you spent time in the school, the same person who was not very good at studies, the same person who was naughty, is now a very powerful person and is actually running things, is actually into the administration of an area or maybe is into politics holding a great power so your own classmates with whom you went school with have become powerful and this is something that you realize down the line if there's anything more calculated to thick men's blood with cold it's that that's how ironic it might be when you Realize that the weakest person in the class has become strongest today. After all, you know how much they did not know then? And give yourself as an example. Given yourself as an example, you cannot assume they know a great deal more now. When that person with very less score in the class has all of a sudden become very powerful, you take yourself in the center and you take yourself as an example and then you think okay this person was not very smart in the school days and even now this person is not very smart but how come he or she is more powerful that person cannot be more powerful than I am and then you will think we're all doomed for example one of your friends is in position of power now, the friend has become very powerful. Let me not say friend, let me say classmate. The classmate is weak in school, the classmate did not get good grades and now is the powerful person who is into the administration of your city, is into politics. What would you think? Our city is unlucky. We are all doomed. We are all ill-fated to have such a person ruling us. For example, Brian Mulroney is only a year older than I am. But still, this person is a Canadian politician who served as 18th Prime Minister of Canada. This person might not be very good in his school days, but now is the 
powerful politician. You may feel that the only thing to do when you have reached this stage is to take up nail biting mantras or joking, all of which would be recognized by animal behavior specialists as substitution activities like scratching, which are resorted to in moments of unresolved conflict. So, one fine day you get to know that your own classmate who did not score really well is one of the most powerful persons around. What do you do in that case? You start doing some extra activities like chanting mantras or jogging, something. Because you cannot digest the fact that how that person has become powerful all of a sudden and such activities is tagged by the animal doctors as substitution activities, extra activities which are done by the people during a conflict which is unresolved. But we will get around to some positive thinking in a moment. I know I've been talking negative but we will be talking about positive things very soon and very quickly. What shall I tell them? I thought, breaking out into a cold sweat as I tossed in turn night after night. So I got the invitation from this college. I responded back that all right, I'll come and give a speech. But then I was lost because I realized the seriousness of what was expected of me. They expected something more. They expected me to deliver a speech to prepare you all for life. They expected me to prepare a speech wherein I could gear you up for facing the real world. And so I thought, hmm, what shall I tell them? Because it is really not pleasant after the college days. Lest you leap to indulge in Calvinistic guilt at the idea of having been the proximate cause of my discomfort, let me hasten to add that I was on a boat. So before you start protesting against me, before you indulge into a reformation-like activity, because I caused you some discomfort with my negative talks, let me tell you that I was in a tough situation myself when I cleared the college. I was on a boat. I was in an unpleasant situation after the college. The tossing and turning was par for the course and the cold sweat can be cured by gravel. Now, why did I toss and turn? Because I was expected to do so much in my speech and According to me, my tossing and turning was valid, was legitimate because this is a serious topic. For a while, I toyed with the idea of paraphrasing Kurt Vonnegut, who told one graduating class, everything is going to become unbelievably worse and will never get better again and walked off the stage. I thought on the stage, I will just paraphrase something that Kurt Vonnegut said, who is an American writer. I thought I will just simplify whatever he stated. And all he stated was, things are gonna be worse once you clear the college. I spent some time thinking about how I will paraphrase this sentence, how I will elaborate on his ideas. Now. But that's an American style. The way he said is American. And what is the American style? Boom or bust. Either it is great prosperity or it is great decline. That is the American way. And so Kurt spoke in an American way. We are in Canada. So a Canadian would be more apt to say things may be pretty mediocre. But let's at least try to hold the line. What's the Canadian way of saying the same sentence in another way? Things are bad, things are worse, things are difficult, but let's not give up. Let's try harder and harder and fight back. Now that's the Canadian way. Then I thought that maybe I could say a few words on the subject of a liberal arts education and how it prepares you for life. 
So you know, I was having a lot of ideas on what to speak today on this stage. And therefore I tossed and turned. I thought about paraphrasing someone else's sentences. I thought about talking on liberal arts education because I was asked to prepare you all for fighting the real world. When you get into real life, hunt for jobs, hunt for your passion. How should be your mindset? Now that was what the college expected of me. So then I thought of liberal arts because I thought liberal arts can prepare you all to prepare for life. But sober reflection led me to a conclusion that this topic was too a washout. Then I thought about liberal arts for a while and reflected upon the fact that whether liberal arts can really prepare a student for life, I concluded that it doesn't. You will also discover the same thing. Liberal arts does not prepare a person to fight and to live the life to the fullest. A preparation for life curriculum would not consist of courses on Victorian thought and French romanticism, but of things like how to cope up with marital breakdown, getting more for your footwear dollar, dealing with stress, and how to keep your fingernails from breaking off by always filling them towards the center. In other words, it would read like the contents page of Homemakers magazine, which is why Homemakers magazine is so widely read, even by me. So, if you talk about the preparation for life curriculum, now, let me tell you that no school, no university, no college really has a syllabus, really has the curriculum to help you fight and be prepared for your life. This university and this college had the subjects based on Victorian thought and French philosophy, but that does not prepare a student for life. What really prepares a student for life is teaching him or her how to prepare for stress, how not to get stressful, how to be happy all the time, how to be okay when your marriage did not work well, how to have financial stability. Now all of these topics which are very crucial, they can be a preparation for life curriculum and not the Victorian philosophy and French philosophy. And therefore there's a magazine that's uh, going in rounds, it's called Homemakers magazine. Now that magazine has all of these topics like fighting stress, being happy all the time, being okay when your marriage did not work fine. And therefore, Homemakers magazine is read by everyone across this area. Even I read it very often. Or for boys, Forbes or The Economist and improving your place in the power hierarchy by choosing the right suite. So for girls, they can refer to a magazine called Homemakers Magazine and boys can refer to magazines like Forbes or The Economist and how they should fight to get a position when they're in between some powerful people. They can also refer to magazine which help them choose the right attire. For example, dark blue with a faint white pinstripe, not too far apart in case you're interested. All I'm trying to tell you is what the schools and colleges and universities do not teach, do not educate on are few of these things. How to manage stress, how to maintain work-life balance, how to make your position amongst powerful people, how to gain financial stability, how to be alright when your marriage is not working how to choose the right attire for different occasions. Or maybe I thought I should expose glaring errors in the education system or compile a list of things I was taught which are palpably not true. So you know I was thinking about a lot of things that I thought I would say and this is one of them. I thought about today's education system and some of the stereotypes that people have. 
I thought I should speak on some things that students blindly believe and follow. I thought I should point out all the mistakes and make a list of all those mistakes which exist in our education system today. Which I was taught, which I was told, which I was fed, but they are clearly and noticeably not true. For instance, in high school I made the mistake of taking home economics instead of typing. We thought in those days that if you took the commercial course, most of your eyebrows would come off and would have to be drawn on with a pencil for the rest of your life. Where I was told that every meal should consist of a brown thing, a white thing, a yellow thing and a green thing. That it was not right to lick the spoon while cooking and that the inside of a dress seam was as important as the outside. So when I was studying, people told me, why are you choosing typing as your subject? Choose home economics because that only will help you build your career. That subject will help you gain some position, reputation and money from the society. Typing makes no sense. Do not take that subject. People also told me on what to eat and what not to eat. People told me that I should eat something which has protein and some salads and what not. I was told what to eat and what not to eat by people. On a lighter note, some people also told me that if you are cooking and if you are trying to taste the meal that you have cooked with a spoon, do not lick that spoon. It's not good. And the others, they advised me on how important the dressing sense was. All I'm trying to tell you is people will have their own stereotypes. People will tell you all that they think is right but do not believe them. Instead ask yourself and then conclude. All three of these ideas are false and should be discarded immediately by anyone who still holds them. So of all these examples that I gave None of the example is valid, legitimate or true. It's not right. If you want to take typing, go ahead. If you want to eat your favorite recipe without the brown, green or yellow thing, go ahead. If you want to wear your own dress, go ahead. Do not believe people who are having their own thoughts and own stereotypes. Nor did anyone have the foresight to inform me that the best thing I could do for myself as writer would be back and wrist exercises. Now as you all know I wanted to become a writer and in those days I didn't get enough advices like you do, like you got. You have whole lot of people telling you what to do, what not to do, which career you should choose and which you should not. But when I was trying to become a writer, not a single person told me that a writer needs to sit down for hours and hours thinking and writing down his or her thoughts and so it was very important for a writer to do some back exercises, to do some wrist and hand exercises so that it becomes even more stronger and those parts of the body can help a writer pen down his or her thoughts nicely and smoothly. No one has yet done a study of this, but they will and when they start excavating and measuring the spine and arm bones of skeletons of famous writers of the past, I am sure they will find those who wrote the longest novels such as Dickens and Melville also had the thickest wrists. There is no research, there is no study that proves my point. The fact that famous authors had strong wrists. But when they drill down, when they actually start gathering facts of all the authors who wrote long novels, who wrote nice and attractive articles and books, they all had strong wrists. I'm sure one day the researchers will find out what I'm saying. The real reason that Emily Dixon stuck to lyric poems with relatively few stanzas is that she had spindly fingers. Do you know Emily Dixon? She was an American poet and if you go through her poems, they did not have much length. Those poems were short and had few stanzas. 
Do you know why? Because she had long and thin fingers which did not allow her to write long poems. Again, that proves my point. You may scoff, but future research will prove me right. At this moment, you might be thinking, what is this lady speaking? But hold on to it. The scientists and researchers will prove me right one day. But then I thought I shouldn't talk about writing. I mean, I wanted to become a writer. Why am I sharing these thoughts with you? You might want to become a chartered accountant or a geologist or anything else. So when I got an invitation from your university, I thought about speaking on writing and how to become a writer. But then I thought, why? It's not necessary that most of you want to become or might want to become writers. So I discarded that thought as well. Few of this graduating class will wish to be writers and those who do should by no means be encouraged. Yes, I see a lot of students who want to become writers, who want to become novelists or maybe poets. No, don't look at me and don't read my history and get encouraged that yes, this lady is my inspiration. I want to become a writer. No, don't do that. Weave a circle around them thrice and close your eyes, holy dread, because who needs competition? Who needs the competition? So I would just ask you to stop trying to become writers or poets or novelists. Why? Because there is a lot of competition outside. Everybody want to become a writer. Every other person is a writer today and there is so much competition. Do you really want to be in between? Competition? You really want to compete with thousands of writers today? What with the proliferation of creative writing courses, a mushroom of recent growth, all but unknown in my youth, will soon have a state of affairs in which everybody writes, nobody reads. The exact reverse of the way things were when I was composing dolorous verses in the rented cupboard on Charles Street in the early 60s. Now, let me tell you, this subject of creative writing is rapidly increasing. Every other person has gotten into this field of creative writing. When I was young, every other person wanted to become a writer. There will be a situation, there will be a scenario wherein people will keep on writing creative stuff. There will be nobody to read them. Now, today's situation is exactly opposite of what I had in my early days. Situation you guys are facing today is the exact opposite of what I had because I was living in the Charles Street when I was a budding writer and I would write some verses which express sorrow or distress. In short, I was into creative writing. In the early 60s, and there were people to read my work but that's not the case today today everything has changed or maybe i thought i should relate to them a little known fact of shocking import which they will remember vividly when they have all but forgotten the rest of the speech then i thought okay i have to speak at your university today on this stage so let me not talk about inspiration and encouragement let me tell you some facts which you will remember for sure which might shock you and therefore you'll remember very well and that's how I will deliver my speech so I thought of telling you guys a fact that you will remember the most and forget the rest of my speech for example nobody ever tells you but did you know that when you have a baby your hair falls out not all of it and not all at once, but it does fall out. It has something to do with the zinc imbalance. The good news is that it does grow back in. This only applies to girls. With boys, it falls out whether you have a baby or not. And it never grows back in, but even then there is hope. Isn't it interesting? Now, I was going to club all such shocking facts which you would remember after my speech has completed and forget all the rest of my speech. 
Now that's how I was planning to deliver my speech here today. Talking about facts on hair fall and zinc imbalance and how it is different between girls and boys. In a pinch, you can resort to quotation, a commodity which a liberal arts education teaches you to treat with respect. And I offer the following, God only made a few perfect heads and the rest lie covered with hair. Before we understand the meaning, please uh, correct the meaning of resort. Resort obviously is a place that you visit for holidays, but here it's turning to. You can turn to. Please correct the meaning and let's understand the sentence now. So what I was saying is I would have given a speech that would encourage the bald people by saying God only made a few perfect heads and the rest lie covered with hair which means that people who had hair they're not as perfect as the ones who are bald. I was going to tell you something which is also a part of liberal arts education that is to respect everyone and do not rely on their looks. Which illustrates the following point when faced with the inevitable you always have a choice. This is something very important that I wanted to share. In your life, you will have problems. Life without problems is impossible. But the good part is, whenever you have a problem, there are always two choices in front of you. Either to let problem overpower you or learn a lesson from the problem and get out of it. You may not be able to alter the reality, but you can alter your attitude towards it. Yes, the world and what was happening around you, in your society, in your state and city will not change. The reality will not change, but everything changes if you change your attitude, the way you think about it, the way you tackle that situation. It is said that your attitude defines your altitude. Your attitude will define how far you will go. As I learned during my liberal arts education, any symbol can have, in the imaginative context, two versions, a positive and a negative. Everything in this world has a positive and a negative. Now, all of these was a part of liberal arts education. Blood, for example, can either be a gift of life or what comes out of you when you cut your wrists in the bathtub. So two parts of looking at the same thing. If there's blood in front of you, you can with your attitude conclude that okay I see blood in front of me. Now this one liter of blood could help a person who has lost a lot of blood in an accident. So this blood is good. On the other side, if there's blood spilled around the bathroom, you can look at the blood and say that, all right, somebody was heartbroken and blood is all over the place. It's not a good sign. A person should not take such steps. Or somewhat less drastically, if you spill your milk, you're left with a glass which is either half empty or half full. This is a very well-known illustration and this has been going on from decades. If there is a glass full of milk and accidentally your hand hits the glass and the milk is spilled in such a way that only half of the milk is left, you see the glass as half full. You can say that, all right, still I have half of the milk. Or if you are a pessimist, you can say, hmm, half of my milk is gone. Now, what will I drink? So for the same glass, you can have two opinions, positive and negative. Which brings us to the hidden agenda of this speech. So until now, whatever I've said was my planning that I spent so many days and what I thought when I got an invitation from your university. All of this I've shared with you. But now I want to tell you the crux of my speech. I want to tell you exactly what I had planned. What you are being ejected into today is a world that is both half empty and half full. So you people, you cannot conclude that the world is bad or the world is good. 
it's up to you and your attitude to decide whether you want to look at the world as half empty, a place where everything is positive, a place where optimism survives, or you want to look around and straight away conclude that no, the world that we live in is full of false and negativity and pessimism. So just as I gave the example of half full and half empty glass of milk, the same is the situation in the world after you get your degree. On the one hand, the biosphere is rotting away. You all know how humans are responsible for destroying the climate. The biosphere, our environment is getting destroyed by industrialization, by modernization. You all are aware of that. The raindrops that kept falling on your head are also killing the fish, the trees, the animals. And if they keep being as acid as they are now, they'll eventually do away with things a lot closer to home, such as crops, front lawns, and your digestive tract. So what's going on in the world around right now? People are using so much of pesticides, so much of processed stuff that it is destroying the environment and the rain is becoming acidic. Fishes are being killed just like that. The trees, they cannot absorb this acidic water. The animals, they are getting killed, they are getting destroyed. And let me tell you that if the rainwater continues to be acidic as it is today and if nothing is done to stop this then eventually there will be a day when the crops that grow on the farms will be impure and whatever you eat will be poisonous and it will definitely destroy your digestive tracts. Nature is no longer what surrounds us we surround it and the switch has not been for the better. Well, hundreds and thousands of years ago, nature was something that surrounded the human beings. Human beings lived under nature. They loved nature. Nature nurtured the human beings, but the, it has been switched. It has been swapped. Now is the case that because of deforestation, we are surrounding nature. There is one tree or maybe a couple of trees in a vast area. There are so many sophisticated and modernized buildings with few trees in it. So nature is not something that surrounds us. We are surrounding nature and the swap, the switch that has happened. No, it's not good. On the other hand, unlike the ancient Egyptians, we as a civilization know what mistakes we are making and we also have the technology to stop making them. All that is lacking is the will. The ancient Egyptians did not know the mistakes they were making. But today we are very civilized. We can do just about anything with the technology that we have. We can stop the environmental destruction. We can stop the acidic rain. We can stop deforestation. But what's happening? Nobody, not a single human being is willing to stop that. Everybody is being carried away by making more money, growing the business, competing with each other. Not a single human being is taking steps for fighting environmental climate change. Nobody has a will to do that. Another example, on the one hand, we ourselves live daily with threat of annihilation, don't we? You guys tell me, despite of us being educated and civilized and literate, aren't there wars going on outside? Aren't you living under a threat that one day there will be a bombshell dropped by the enemy country on us and we will be destroyed? All I'm trying to say is we are living in a era where we're not safe anymore. We can get completely swiped away. We can get destroyed or obliterated. We're just a computer button and a few minutes away from it. And the gap between us and it is narrowing every day. We are living in a modernized society. Everything is so much 
sophisticated that a person sitting in a remote location can press a button and things in here can get destroyed. Destruction has become so easy these days. We secretly think in terms of when the bomb drops. We secretly think in terms not of if the bomb drops but of when the bomb drops. And it's understandable if we sometimes let ourselves slide into a mental state of powerlessness and consequent apathy. So the world we live in today has forced us to think that there are things happening around us of which we have no control of and therefore we feel powerless. And consequently we feel as if there is nothing interesting going on around us. We have adapted that mental state. On the other hand, the catastrophe that threatens us as species and most other species as well is not unpredictable and uncontrollable like the eruption of volcano that destroyed Pompeii. Have you read about how Pompeii was destroyed by the eruption of volcano? Now who can predict that a volcano will erupt? Not many technologies can. And the events unfolding around us today which can cause sudden damage, sudden suffering. Let me tell you guys, they're all predictable. They're all man-made. It's not like volcanoes or earthquakes that can happen at any time without a warning. What is threatening us human beings as a species, not only us but the other animals and birds and insects as well, is our own man-made activities which are fairly predictable. If it occurs we can die with dubious satisfaction of knowing that the death of the world was man-made and therefore preventable event and that the failure to prevent it was a failure of human will. So if one fine day, God forbid, if something happens to this world and the humankind, the mankind, we will at least be sure of one thing. Whatever happened, it happened because of our own desire, our own will, our own activities. We would know during the last minute that there was nothing unpredictable about the fact that destroyed the species. Everything was done by us humans. This is the kind of world we find ourselves in and it's not pleasant. So few minutes back, I was telling you that this world is as if you are standing at the edge of the cliff and somebody's gonna push you. This is what I was referring to. When you complete your degree from university, when you get out for job search or maybe anything else, no, it's not pleasant. It's not smooth because this is the kind of world we're living in. Faced with facts this depressing, the question of the economy or how many of us in this country can afford two cars doesn't really loom too loud. But you'd never know it from reading the papers. I already told you how bad the world was in. I already told you the sad events that are unfolding in this world right now. I already told you how depressing it is for us today as humans. So if you guys are thinking about how my country's economy will perform or how many of you will be able to buy two cars? No, that's not a big problem. That's nothing compared to what I told you. That's very small. That's very trivial. And if you think these newspapers are telling you the facts, no, they are unable to cope up with everything that's going on in this world. You will never be able to get the clear idea of all the events unfolding by merely reading the newspapers. Things are in fact a lot worse elsewhere, where expectations center not on cars and houses and jobs, but on the next elusive meal. So to buy a car, to buy a house, to get a job, these are not the burning problems of the world today. People are unable to get food twice a day. People are unable to satisfy their hunger. It is that bad. That's the part of the downside. The upside here and now is that this is still more or less a democracy. You don't get to shout or tortured yet for expressing an opinion 
and politicians, motivated as they may be by greed and the lust of power, are nevertheless, or because of this, still swayed by public opinion. I told you about the downside of the current situation in the world right now. But what is the positive side? What is the upside? What is so good about today's current situation? The good part is we are still living in a democracy where you can express your opinions out loudly. You can easily establish that you like these things, you dislike these things. And for that, you do not get shot at, you do not get tortured yet. You are free to express your opinions. And these politicians, they only work according to the public opinion. They only listen to the people and act. Although they are always attracted by lust for power, they think they'll get powerful and they'll get rich and they'll be able to control the whole society by becoming politicians. The upside here and now is that this is a still more or less a democracy. You don't get shot or tortured yet for expressing an opinion and politicians motivated as they may be by greed and the lust for power are nevertheless or because of this still swayed by public opinion. So I told you about the downside of the current situation of the world. There's a lot of pessimism, negativity, etc, etc. But what's the positive side? We are still living in a democracy. You can cite your opinions out loud and for that, fortunately, the police do not shoot you. For that, the government do not torture you. You can express your thoughts out and loud. There is no punishment for it. And do you know what? These politicians, they think, okay, I'll become a politician and I'll become powerful and financially strong, etc, etc. But these politicians, first they listen to the public. First they take opinions from the people and only then they can become politicians. Doesn't matter how much they are attracted to power and lust and greed. The issues raised in any election are issues perceived by those who want power to be of importance to those in a position to confer it upon them. So there is a burning issue in the society. A person brings it up. Now the same person is willing to be in power and who grants him a position or power is the people. People, they give opinions to that person and the person brings it up in a gathering where the same person gets power. It becomes important all of a sudden just because he listened to the people. In other words, if enough people show by the issues they raise and by the way they are willing to vote that they want changes made, then change becomes possible. So. Power lies in the hands of whom? It lies in the hands of us, the people. If you think there's something wrong going on in the society or environment or in this world, raise your voice, get together, make groups, make the opinion out loud, clear and ask people to make changes in whatever's going on. It's only then that change will be made. Let me reiterate, you may not be able to alter reality, but you can alter your attitude towards it and this paradoxically alters reality. It's all dependent on how you perceive things. If your attitude towards a problem is optimistic, positive, then there is no doubt that you'll be able to change the problem into a solution. Your attitude will determine where you will go in your life, where you will progress in your life. Just try and see. Let me become Professor DC again and tell you that I hope this chapter was clear to you. If not, then ask your questions in the comment section and I will try to address all of them. I thank you and I hope you have a wonderful day ahead. 
So, what is this speech all about? And why is this speech so important? Now, as I've already mentioned, this speech was written back in June 14th, 1983. But this still holds true. Even today, what she said is valid 